Well, in the video, you saw that a bicycle is not going to get the job done. You know, you can only ride a bike so far. If you're trying to go to California from Ohio on a bicycle, you're eventually going to get tired. That Ferrari could do a little better job. So if you want to change levels, you're going to have to change processes. You're going to have to change how you live life, right? And who wants to change? Well, we say we do, but how many know we don't? And so tonight, I hope I inspire you to change. We're going to talk about the kingdom of God tonight. We're going to talk about you. We'll get real personal. That's why you're here, right? You want to get personal, don't you? Well, I'm going to put up on the screen, I think your team has, do you have this picture of my daughter? Do we have that one ready to go before and after I call it my team? I don't know if they got that there. Yes? No? No, not that one, my before and after shot. Uh, before, it says before and after. There it is. Okay, here's my, you saw the youngest daughter with our dog, and this is the oldest. We have five children. Um, the, these two pictures were taken eight hours apart. Uh, the picture on the left is our daughter with a tumor in her abdomen, as you can see, and uh, we, she spent about 30 days rehearsing the covenant she has in healing, asked our team to pray for her, and Nothing happened when we laid hands on her, but she knew that she was healed by Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore, when you pray, you believe you receive and you shall have it. So you, you receive when you pray, not when it shows up. So she said, yes, I am healed. And then two weeks later, she went to bed and woke up like on the right. In fact, that picture was taken when she woke up that day. 13 pounds, lost that evening, nine inches in her waist. Her back, which was twisted and knotted, was instantly healed as she slept. So she went to bed one way, and she woke up the other way. Do we have the picture of the spine before and after? On the left, you see how straight the spine is. It's twisted. On the right, you'll see the curve is back overnight. That's better than a chiropractor can do, I'll tell you that. Now, that power of God, uh, obviously, that was a great deliverance and healing. But that same power of God is available for your finances. So you need to have that understanding that there is a... The covenant you have with God, the same power is available to transform your life. And God wants you to have money. So I'm going to do some review. How many are any partners here tonight? I know I have a few. Good to see all of you. And we're going to take, we have two sessions. And I want to thank the pastors, lovely family. I just met them today. I've heard their names for many years, but I just met them today. And uh, what a privilege, what a great example you have here of a family in ministry a successful family in ministry, and uh, just a great example. So that's not every day you find in the body of Christ. So congratulations. Great work there. But I'm going to spend some time reviewing some basic principles, and then the second session, we're going to go past that. Some of you that have been following us for a while, you'll see some, we're going to cover some of the basics because you always have to cover the basics to set the stage for the next event. If you're a football player, you always practice the blocking and tackling, not the latest play, right? Because the latest play is not going to do a thing if you can't get the blocking and tackling right. So we're going to spend some time reviewing some of the basics that God had to teach us. Drenda already mentioned our situation. We were Christians, Old Testament degree, a year of Bible school, loved God, loved the anointing, loved the goosebumps, loved the stories of God, but we were broke, man. We were bad off for nine years. I wish it was like a week, but it was nine years of living in a bad situation. As I was telling your, your our pastors here to, uh, today earlier that the carpet in their boys' bedroom was found in a trash pile on the road, mattresses, nursing home, discard pile. Everything was broken. Cars were barely starting. Tax IRS liens, judgments against us, owed our relatives thousands of dollars. I told your pastors that uh, when my, I called my dad, the first thing he would say to me is, how much do you need this time? Now, I was in sales, commission only, and for nine years, that will wear you out. So I developed panic attacks. Um, I developed paralysis in my body. I had um, antidepressants. I was afraid to leave my house. It doesn't go well when you're in sales, but I'm telling you, it was hell on earth. It was hell on earth. We couldn't even, we, had, we searched our cushions to find pennies to buy Happy Meals. I mean, we did not have a picture of a great future. I used to envision what would it even be like to have $100. I didn't know anyone. I couldn't even see that. I just couldn't even see that. 
And we were living in a little farmhouse, $300 a month. We could barely pay that, missed it sometimes. I mean, we were just living hand to mouth, pawned everything we could. And so it wasn't working out. Lamentations 3.17 says, I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. If you have forgotten what prosperity is, or you don't have prosperity, you don't have peace. There is no freedom without financial freedom. There is no freedom without financial freedom because you live in the earth realm. Money is required. Money is influence. Money is options, right? You have to have money more than enough. Of course, most people live paycheck to paycheck. Fear is a bad taskmaster. It's a horrible taskmaster. The Bible says there's torment with it. And I lived there for years, nine years, and ran out of all the options and got desperate Des- more desperate. You had to, took nine years to get desperate? <laughs> That's crazy. Why do people go, you know, it didn't have to be nine years. We could have figured this out earlier. The Lord has shown us, but we lived that way. But got desperate, cried out to God. And he spoke to me and said, I didn't have anything to do with this. First thing he said, I, first thing he said was uh, Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches. Say his riches, his riches. in Christ Jesus. And so... I didn't have that. And I said, I mean, I knew that scripture. I didn't have that scripture. So I said, I I don't, I know that scripture, God, I don't have it. He says, I know you don't have it. Here's why. You've never learned how my kingdom operates. You've never learned how my financial system operated. And uh, then he went on and said a few more things to me, but basically kingdom, what kingdom? I mean, I have an Old Testament degree. I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit. I go to a great church. We serve in the church. I mean, we love God, but what do you mean kingdom? right? I mean, I, I'm going to heaven. What do you mean how your kingdom operates? I didn't have a clue what that meant. Kingdom means king's dominion. It means the, uh, the kingdom is a government, which means the king's authority and his laws flow through a governmental system of laws to every citizen in that kingdom. Kingdom. You live in a kingdom, right? The kingdom of God. So I began to ask God, okay, what does it mean? Now, I, had to, I repented to Drenda. We held hands and prayed. We said, God, we have no clue what you're talking about, but right now we make a commitment to stop using debt, and you have to teach us what you're talking about. We had no clue. So, you know, how did Peter come to follow Jesus? He's a fisherman, and he was astonished at the catch of fish, right? Well, God used the same thing for me in deer hunting. Uh, it is deer season. Anyone hunt out here in Arizona? I don't know. All right, good for you. But in Ohio, you know, we hunt. But when you have no food, you really hunt. (laughs) And we are going out. I was going out every year and not getting anything. And the Lord spoke to me after. I said, teach me kingdom. He goes, okay, uh, let me help you with your deer this year. Okay, what does that mean? Help me with my deer. You know, you're going to tie one up. I mean, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. He said, take a check out. On the check in the memo section, write for your 1987 buck. This is when this all took place. He says, you and your wife, join hands. Lay your hands on that check. You release it. As you speak these words, I re- we receive, come into agreement, we receive a, a buck when we hunt that deer. We're going to receive it right now, not when we pray, Mark 11:24. 24. He said, you receive it right now, not when it shows up. That's a key. So I took a little piece of paper out. We did that. I wrote down the piece of paper. I receive my buck on the date that we prayed that prayer. I wrote the date down. It is done. It is finished. Mark 11, 24. We received that deer. We lived in Oklahoma. And if you know much about deer hunting, you always want to hunt someplace. You have some kind of knowledge of the land and layout. You might want to scout sometime. We didn't know. It didn't have much time. A guy that we knew in church said, why don't you come down to Tahlequah, Oklahoma to have Thanksgiving with our family? And by the way, there's a few deer there, he said. Bring your rifle. I said, all right, I'll do that. So I go down to Tahlequah. It's, it's at night. You know, you, you go in the morning before light. Get, it, get out of the car, meet him. I say, okay, Don, where do, where do I go hunt? Where do I hunt? I mean, it's dark. You can't see anything, right? I've never been there. He's, oh, there's this big field over here. It's a big field. There's a tree in the middle of the field. Go, go out and sit next to that tree. Well, I went out there. As it got light, I realized I was in a field, all right, but a barren field, a harvested hay field. If you know about deer hunting, deer are not stupid. They don't commit suicide, right? (laughs) They're not going to walk up to you in the middle of an open field and say, here I am. I'm sitting next to this one tree, and as light comes on, I'm going, this is stupid. 
I'm out here in the middle of this barren field with this field has one tree in it. I mean, you know, it's crazy. Deer are in the woods, right? I mean, I'm out in this field. So I'm sitting there without me knowing it. What happens is I'm sitting next to a tree without me knowing it. A buck is crossing the field, this barren field, right towards my tree without me knowing it. I'm on the opposite side. He comes up to the tree, the tree I'm at, the only tree, and he smells me. And so he snorts, he like, and I'm sitting next to the tree. I look up, his face is five feet from my face. And he takes off at a dead run. I mean, it happens so fast. He's moving out. You ever seen a white-tailed deer run? I mean, they, you know, they, move, they bound, okay? A rifled 30 out six with a full pace running deer is not an easy shot to hit. And you have about you know, so many seconds to do it. And I dropped that deer. I'm sitting there going, what just happened? I have a deer, I have my buck, you know? I'm not that good. So Don, my friend, comes out of the house. Did you get the deer? I said, yeah, I got him. He comes out, I said, come here, Don. I, did, I, didn't, I mean, I did this, but this isn't me. I pulled that piece of paper out and said, God told me to do this, and I have my deer. So the next year, I did the same thing, got my deer, get my deer. It's been, what's 87, how many years is that? I get my deer every year now in 30 to 40 minutes. In fact, this past Monday, I went out. It's crazy. People say, oh, you love to hunt. Well, I don't really hunt anymore. I receive. And then this is not a joke. Now, I'm not, I'm not kidding. I don't hunt deer. I receive deer. There's a big difference. Monday, this past Monday, I go, I hunt with a bow. So I go up, you know, climb, it's dark. I go up in the, in the, climb up in the tree. And within five minutes or so, 15 minutes total, I'm done. I'm heading back to the house. With my deer, a seven-point buck. Got him, take care. So it's like, I love to hunt. I like to try it sometime, but I said, it's like 15 minutes. It's like, I guess I already went hunting this year. It's just 15 minutes. I received. This happened for 30-some years. Now, in the beginning, I was astounded. The stories I have about hunting, I always am embarrassed almost to tell people because they are so crazy you're going to think I'm one of those wackos or some kind of weird thing, but the book I have, Faith Hunt, has a lot of the stories in it. But what happened was, as I began to learn, I went from Oklahoma to Ohio. Ohio allowed two deer a year, Oklahoma one, but one had, only one could be a buck. So I went to Ohio. I got two deer in 40 minutes or whatever. I mean, it's just, it's crazy. But the thing was, when I sowed my seed, I'd say, I'm believing God. I'm releasing my faith for a doe and a buck or a buck and a doe, whatever. They came in the order that was listed. And I noticed that one day. I said, wait a minute. I have it written down. I'm believing God for a buck and a doe. And the buck comes. Then the next time I go out, a doe comes. What would happen if I reverse it? So I tried it. A doe came. Then the buck came. I said, wait a minute now. Are you trying to tell me that that thing came? So the day uh, I was, I was up in my tree stand, I was learning these principles, and uh, saw the, uh, sowed my seed for a buck, and he's walking across the field in my neighbor's field, a couple hundred yards away into their woods. He's about, I know he's going to be, you know, he's, he's going in their woods. And I said, Lord, that's the buck. I said, that's my buck. He said, tell it to come to you. I said, deer, you know, what do you mean? Obviously, I'm not going to yell at it. But I said, deer, stop, turn around. And I was bow hunting. I was just learning to bow hunt. And I, I, I didn't have any camouflage on, no sense. I knew nothing about really bow hunting. My stand was only 12 yards up in a pine tree. I mean, I'm not you know, if you're a bow hunter, you know, it's a little more sophisticated than that, right? It's, uh, so anyway, I said, stop, turn around, come here. And I said, stand under my tree. I mean, I figured if I'm going to have God's help, I might as well have it all the way. <laughs> that buck, the minute I said that, stopped, looked both directions, turned around and meandered 200 yards back. Now, there's a whole woods full of trees and stood still right under my tree. I took him home. I said, did I just see that? Now, we went on to experiment. I, won't, I don't have time to tell you all the things. We experimented by choosing the, the, the rack, you know, the size deer and the odd points on the deer. And that is exactly what would come. I mean, it's the, the kingdom is very specific. So anyway, I figured, eventually figured out this would work for money too. <laughs> so not just deer. And so God began to teach me about the kingdom of God, right? So, you know, you say, that's crazy, but my freezer's full. I don't know if yours is or not. 
So we got out of debt in two and a half years. We began to pay cash for our cars. We started companies. Uh, we built our dream home. I mean, all these things. We, our life changed. We began to give money away. I mean, freedom was a whole lot better than nine years of absolute starvation. I mean, it was like a light switch came on. We were so excited. I mean, can you imagine what it's like going into a car dealership and paying cash for a car when you've spent nine years digging pennies out of a couch to find a happy meal or to build your dream home? I mean, do you understand how that felt? It's like we literally cried. They dug the basement. We were actually there weeping. We could hardly even conceive of what we saw happening in our lives. So we got out of debt. We, we started companies. I mean, it was just amazing. I began to look around in the body of Christ. I realized, wait a minute, most of the people I see are not enjoying what I have been enjoying. They are not winning financially. They're not winning with opportunities. They're not getting their deer, if you will. They're not winning financially. They love God like I did. They're in church like I was. They, they have all the things that I had, but they don't have what God taught me. And so I began to ask the Lord. I said, God, I mean, I got to help these people because our life was like drastically changing very fast. And I knew if I could sit down with them for, I knew one hour wouldn't change it. I knew I, knew I couldn't do it in an hour. I won't be able to do it tonight either. But tonight I hope to catch your attention to move you that direction. But I said, I had this thought, if I could do five sessions, I thought if I could do six hours of teaching, five hours of teaching, I could probably get someone down to understand the kingdom enough to make an impact. And so I began to envision and pray about that. And of course, I was just pastoring at the time. Found out, by the way, we began to pastor that a lot of people wanted to hear about the kingdom. God called us to pastor later you know, in, in our lives, and I found out that people are really curious about wanting to enjoy the kingdom and, and life. So our church grew. That's why it's called the good news of the kingdom, right? Good, gospel means good news. And so I began to pray about that. I did not want to do it in my own church because I've, been, I've taught my church all these principles. And a friend of ours in Albania, missionary, said, why don't you come to Albania? I'm doing a conference. and want you to teach the principles here because this country is really bad off financially coming out of uh, atheism, essentially. Albania is one, if not the only country in the world that in its constitution said there's no God. So the people had been closed off until 1991. The country had just opened up, and they were open to receive outside input. My missionary friend had been there for a few years and invited me to come along. He's doing his annual conference. I said, yes. He said, I'll give you three, three sessions. Except one thing, Pastor Gary, you have to pay your way there and their way there. So you're going to pay your way and all the pastors. I said, all right, it's fine. I'll do that. So we paid our way there, and then the pastors, we got there, and he met me at the plane and said, well, the other speaker canceled. You have five sessions. So I knew that was God because I've been praying about five sessions. So I would pray in the Spirit, write notes down, teach a session. When I first got there, they just stared at me. The first session, they stared at me. The second session, I could see them starting to crack a little bit, you know, because they're hearing stories, they're hearing the kingdom. By the third session, they were pretty happy. They're getting, an, they're getting uh, a revelation of who they are, what they have potential of, because in Albania, the objective was to leave Albania as soon as possible. Go to Spain, Italy. There's no work in Albania. It's just poverty. But they're getting a, a picture on the inside of them that they don't have to necessarily leave Albania they're learning they can create wealth from the inside out, wherever they're at. Fourth session, they're excited. I mean, they're bouncing off the walls, and then God says, take an offering. I said, God, you got to be kidding. I paid their way here. They're broke. They have no money. He said, take an offering. They have to. They, it doesn't matter the amount. They have to give. They have to release their faith. So I told the missionary that, and he said, well, fine, go ahead. So the fifth session, after it, we took an offering, and the power of God fell in that place. We had four people up front with baskets, I have never seen anything like it. The people were dancing and shouting in the anointing of God. The people up front could not even stand up. It was amazing outpouring of God. And so on the way back to the missionary's house, he had two full bags of money. He said, whenever I've taken an offering before, I get a quarter of one bag. I said, see, they've been lying to you. They have money. <laughs> so we went to his house, and there he poured the contents out on his little table in his apartment and the minute he did that, the room filled with a blue haze. And the, I would say it's um, 
the holiness of God. It was the presence of God. I have never seen anything like that. I was just in Cambodia two weeks ago. This blue haze showed up there, and angels showed up in the meeting as well. This blue haze was like, what is this? What, what, is, what is the blue haze? I mean, we couldn't stand up. We were in the, we just, it just, it just knocked us into the couches. We're sitting there and going, you know, we don't know what's going on. I looked in the room on the table. There was the money he had poured out. In the middle was a man's wedding band. And as I saw the wedding band, the Lord spoke to me. He said, I'm sending you to the nations to teach my people my covenant of blessing in the financial area and where I send you, I'll pay for it. I like how he added that last part. That's, that's good. So we came back from, from that meeting. I mean, I, I couldn't sleep for three or four days. I, my whole life was now changing upside down because I have, I have an assignment. And I knew, I knew I had to help people understand these principles. I got back to the States a pastor of a 65-member church in Utah was a friend of this missionary. He said, I heard what happened. We have some poverty issues out here. Can you come to our church? I said, sure. I mean, I'm just anxious to tell anyone. What I just saw in Albania, I'm, okay, okay, he just spoke to me. I'm going, I'm going to Utah. I don't care if there's two people there. You know, wherever God sends me, right? So I get there. I teach the same five sessions. The blue haze did not show up, but the anointing was so strong there that, again, people had trouble standing. This time I was taking the offering for our own ministry. I had a money bag. I zipped it up, took it back with me to Ohio, gave it to our secretary, Tracy, went to lunch. At lunch, the cell phone rings. It's Tracy, I think, because I can't hear anyone. I answer the phone. There's no one. Hello? There's no one there. Then I hear a woman weeping in the background. Now, it says Tracy on my phone, so I know that's Tracy. I said, Tracy, what's Tracy? What's wrong? Tracy. She said, what? What? What happened to that money in Utah? I'm thinking, what is she talking about? What do you mean what happened to the money in Utah? She said, well, I unzipped this bag. I poured it on the desk, and the power of God knocked me on the ground. The other secretary in the other room heard the commotion, came around, and she had the same effect. She said, you tell me what happened to that money. I said, I have no clue what happened with that money. A church down in Athens, Ohio, a small little church, asked me to come and teach. I was busy. I couldn't, so I said, I'll send you DVDs. I sent four DVDs. I'll come down the last session, and we'll cover the last session in person. I went down the last session, taught it. The anointing was so strong there. They put a basket in the front of the church, and they gave, and the anointing just filled that place. And there, a blue orb appeared over that basket as they gave their offerings. This blue, that same blue orb appeared. We began to do conferences that year. I think we did like amazingly 200. I mean, we did a lot of, con I would go anywhere anyone asked because I was so excited to share. We would always take an offering at the last session and it was almost universal that every session we took the last offering, people had trouble standing and we took the offering back to count it or, you know, to, to package it up. You could take a quarter or a coin or a piece of the offering I tell my staff, come here. I put it in their hand, and they begin to shake under the power of the Holy Spirit. And I thought, God, you mean the anointing is on the money? It was on the money. I said, how can it be on the money? I don't understand that. God said to me, I prayed. He began to tell me. He said, well, my people give legally most of the time, like it's a, a debt owed, or they're, gonna, they're, they're not pleasing God by not giving. They give legally. They give because they feel compelled to, or they're not a good Christian if they, or if, if they don't give. But he said, you've taken the time to teach them faith and my kingdom, so they're actually releasing faith. Wherever faith is, the anointing is. And it was on the money. I mean, totally transformed my thinking about this. It was amazing. So what was it that I taught the people in Albania? You can have those same five sessions. We have it on our Financial Revolution CD set or DVD set. I know some of you are doing it as a small group here, and I've heard great reports about that. But it's back there. Uh, at our product table. So I want to touch a little bit on the basics of that foundation, and then I'm going to go on to my new book, which will be released in just a month, but it's so exciting. Do you realize what you have your hands on, what, who you really are? I'm talking about you are a citizen of the kingdom of God, man. It is absolutely life-changing. So the answer, what was it I learned, is Luke chapter 6, verse 20. Blessed are the poor, for you feel sorry for them. Hey, that's how a lot of Christians operate. Why do we feed the hungry and clothe them? Because we feel sorry for them? No, we are saying, come to Father's house. In Father's house, there's a lot of provision. 
But that's not, not how people typically do that. Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the what? Kingdom of God. Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom. Why do people cross from Mexico into the U.S.? The scenery? What is it? Opportunities, which is, which is made available by the government, the laws of this country, correct? That's why they come here. Is that right? Because in our country, you, and we're believing God it stays this way, that you get to keep some of what you make. You have an unlimited potential. I know Pastor Scott, he's a businessman, right? He has businesses. I mean, and so he's motivated to have businesses because of the culture allows him to create and dream and receive profit on his, what he creates, right? It's not that way in every country. They don't have that opportunity. So where is the kingdom? So blessed are you who are poor if yours is the kingdom. Where's the kingdom at? Luke chapter 17, verse 20, the kingdom of God does not come by observation for it is where? In us. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is in you. Isaiah chapter nine, again, this is a review to get to the second session, but I want to lay a foundation here. And if you are part of our partners, it's just great to review this. We read this at Christmas time, chapter nine, verse six, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the what? The what? Government will be on his shoulders. He's the head of this government. And he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace. There'll be no end. He'll reign on David's throne over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. This is a super vital statement you have to understand. Most Christians beg God. Do you know that? Most Christians beg God. They think if they pray long enough, fast long enough, do right things long enough, that God will hear their prayer. Did you know that's, I mean, really, that's how most Christians function. They have zero confidence to know for a fact that they have what the Bible says. I'm just telling you. Now, this scripture is a key to your understanding it says the kingdom is a government, so all governments have laws, right, that enforce the righteousness. Now, just change the word righteousness to the laws of the king. The king is who declares what is right. Righteousness is simply what the king says is right. That's righteousness, right? So essentially, the king declares the law. The government's job is to enforce and to ensure every citizen has what the law says, so, for instance, this scripture says that the kingdom of God is established and upheld by justice and righteousness. What is justice? This is vital. Justice, the definition of justice is administration of law. So the kingdom of God is upheld by laws. It's a government upheld by laws, God's laws, what he has dictated, justice and righteousness. What God's, so justice enforces righteousness. You got it? Justice, the administration of law, enforces what the king says is right. On whose behalf? The citizens of that kingdom, right? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 says that you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household. So you are sons and daughters of God, which means you have the inheritance, but you're also citizens of God, which means you have the kingdom. You got it? You're citizens of the United States and of Arizona. Of the United States, you have legal rights. You don't have to feel those rights. You don't have to feel goosebumps. You don't have to feel, I feel like I'm a citizen of the U.S. today. <laughs> All I have to do is look at your birth certificate, and I know that you are, right? So citizenship in the kingdom of heaven is no different. It is a legal fact. Yet most Christians do business defending themselves against the enemy, not with legal facts, but with feelings. I am a citizen, thus I have legal, fact, legal rights, and I have access to justice. Now, catch this. I have access to justice. If someone is robbing your house, and they're taking furniture out and all your stuff, and you're there at the house, would you say, oh, my goodness, you're going to take all of it? Just, oh, not that, too. Don't take, oh, oh, darn, they took, you're not taking that, too, are you? Oh, would you act that way? And then pretty soon you're robbed blind. What would you do? Come on, help me out. You would call who? Because what do you want them to do? 
to enforce what? The law. And what is the process of enforcing the law? Court. And the judge rules, at least supposed to, Pastor, on behalf of the law. So the judge's whole job is to make sure you as a citizen have what is right or what is the law says, correct? So someone meets you in the courthouse and says, I've got, to, I, you, you live in my house and you have, the, you have the, the deed to your property in your pocket. How nervous would you be? You have the signed deed in your pocket. That's your property. And someone says, no, that's my property. He drags you into court. Would you be nervous about that? No, that's why 1 John 5.14, I was telling your pastor this, or Pastor, pastor Tom today, is probably the most misunderstood scripture by most Christians. This is your confidence. If you ask anything according to the will of God, he hears it, and if he hears it, I know that I have what I've asked of him. Let's, re, let's rehearse this now. This is my confidence. If I ask anything according to the will of God, what he declares is right, what the law of his kingdom says, I know that he hears it, meaning not audibly hears it, but as a judge, he hears the case and he's going to ensure justice is done on your behalf. So my confidence is that the judge is going to rule on my behalf and then he's going to enforce that with his police force, which Hebrews 1.14 says, every angel is a ministering spirit sent to minister on behalf of those who inherit salvation. Angels are going to kick the devil out of the way because... God is reinforcing through the process of justice what is legally yours. And it has nothing to do with feelings. Absolutely zero. You got that. Absolutely zero. So we have to understand this is a kingdom. This is what changed my life. When God began to teach me it's a kingdom that has laws, I wasn't the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I was quick enough to realize if it's laws, I could learn those. And if I could learn those laws, laws don't change. They work for anyone at any time, right? If I drop this Bible, I know it's going to fall every single time. And the reason people say, oh, that's a miracle, is because you're not convinced of the laws of God. Because a miracle is a connotation of something that happens outside of the normal, right? Doesn't surprise God that someone was healed or something happened. It's, just, it's his law. It's what's supposed to happen. The reason you didn't come in here tonight and you're going, oh my goodness, these lights are on, it's because you've already renewed your mind to how lights operate. But go back 5,000, 2,000 years ago, if they came in here with all these lights on, these big screens, what would they say? That's a miracle because they didn't understand it. The reason you do not say that today is because you've renewed your mind, you anticipate, I mean, you're not holding to your chair hoping you don't, I mean, how many are nervous about floating off your chair right now? You are confident in the law of what? Gravity. You don't even think about it. You anticipate it. You expect it. And that's how the kingdom of God operates. If you will learn his laws and anticipate it, renew your mind to them, you'll anticipate and enjoy the benefit of his kingdom. So this is how God began to teach me how this works. I'm going to tell you just a couple more stories. You got that so far? So when I deal with the enemy, I don't go by feelings. There's no condemnation in Christ. It's not my righteousness I do battle with. I don't stand here and say, well, you know. No, it's a legal issue. Jesus paid the price. It is a back off, bud. It's a legal issue. You know what I'm saying? It's a legal issue. I don't have to feel like I'm in faith. Now, faith does have evidences, and you'll learn to recognize those and read those to know if you aren't. You can get out of faith and be in faith. But I don't look for the feeling. It's a legal issue. I'm saved because I called on the name of Jesus. That's done. I don't have to go to the altar every day, every time they say, raise your hand or whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm in the kingdom. It's a legal issue. If I need healing, it's a legal issue. I make claim on justice. I make claim on the legal side. Jesus said healing's like the children's bread. It's as common in his house as the sunshine is here in Arizona. I mean, it's just part of the, part of the citizenship and being members of his household, right? And so it's a legal issue. So what happened? Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. Adam had the kingdom. He was placed on the earth to rule on behalf of God. Let's look at 317. I'm going to kind of wrap this up for this session here in just a minute. But I want to just touch base here before we go on. Adam had it all. Would you agree? No worry, no stress, no sickness, all the provision he needed, everything. He had an assignment, and he gave it away. 
He gave it away. Now it says in Hebrews, actually Hebrews, the second chapter, let me read this to you. Verse number seven, Hebrews two, verse number seven. You made man a little bit lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and put everything under his feet. How much was placed under his feet? Everything. He was crowned with glory and honor. Honor the position he held. He was positioned on the earth as a son of God, ruling the earth on God's behalf. He had the position and authority of the honor, the position, and the glory, meaning the anointing and everything that came with his place in the kingdom. And it says everything was placed under him. In putting everything, verse number eight, in putting everything under him, God left how much? Nothing that was not subject to him. So man ruled the earth. That's why he had to name the animals. God gave him the earth to rule with delegated authority under the kingdom of God. Satan despised that authority. Satan had already been cast out of heaven. Satan was in the garden already with man. And we could go down that trail for a long way, but the bottom line, Satan despised this lowly creature that bore the glory of God and the authority of the kingdom. He had to get that crown off that guy's head, but he had no authority to do that. So he had to deceive Eve and deceive them, and he knew that Adam had to take the crown off himself. And he deceived him in doing that. Adam took the crown off and became subject to Satan's already declared judgment. Follow me. God does not choose who goes to heaven and hell. Do you understand that? Man came under the jurisdiction of the kingdom. The Bible says the kingdom of darkness. Satan was already judged. Man choosing Satan, Adam choosing Satan, came under the judgment that Satan already had. In fact, Matthew says, hell was never made for man, but Satan and his angels. Are you with me? That's why you say, how could God put a, a, quote, good person in hell? God doesn't throw anyone in hell. They're already going to hell. Not because if they're good or bad, but because Jesus is the only escape plan out of the judgment that has come upon all mankind through what Adam did in the beginning, coming under the jurisdiction of the kingdom of darkness. It has nothing to do with you being good or bad. Nothing. Adam drug the entire, all of mankind to hell because he came under Satan. Is that making sense? Jesus is a rescue plan that God put in place to rescue his creation. And whoever calls on that name can escape that, that judgment. So that's a fantastic plan of salvation. But in that curse, when Adam sinned, <clears throat> when he lost the kingdom, he became a survivalist. In the 17th verse, God comes to him and says, Now the earth is cursed because of you. God did not curse the earth. Adam did. And because he cursed the earth or he gave the jurisdiction over the earth to Satan, Adam lost his provision, his health, all the benefits of the kingdom of God, the authority over Satan, he lost that. And the Bible says, God says to him, let me pull that up, 317. He says, now curse the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you'll eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. You'll eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you'll eat your food until you return to the ground. So I call this the earth curse system. It's a system of painful toil and sweat. You grew up in that system. Meaning that if I said you have to get out of debt right now, by the end of the year, you only have one concept of how to do that, and that is through painful toil and sweat. I'll grit my teeth. I'll work 20 hours a day. The only concept we have been raised with of provision is labor. Are you with me? We were all raised with that system of labor. But that's not how it was in God's house. In fact, I I don't have time. It's just just such a big topic. It just goes deep. The parable of the uh, prodigal son ran away from the kingdom, and he had memory that even in God's house, the servants have more food. But as a son in the house... What did he have? The whole estate. So Adam lost his position, his honor. Now he's a survivalist. Fear enters his life. Now he had an assignment to take care of God's stuff, rule the earth on behalf of God. That's now tossed aside because he's in survival mode and now finding provision and surviving another day through painful toil and sweat becomes his personal assignment. He loses 
he loses complete awareness of who he really is. In other words, if you saw Adam after he fell, you'd say he's a messed up dude. His two sons fought, one killed the other. They got marriage problems. They're, they're under great stress, right? You say he's a loser, he's not prospering, right? You say loser, family problems, severe pr- But see, you never saw him how he was created to be as royalty, what he carried with him. And this is what the devil wants you to see yourself as after the fact, instead of what God had created you to be. Now, Jesus has made a way for you to be restored into that position by renewing your mind to who, what he has done, okay? All right, so let's go on. So painful toil and sweat is the system you operate under, but we get tired of that. Jesus said in Matthew, the unbeliever runs after the things of life. Painful toil and sweat is the only method you understand how to get things done. This is why gambling is a lure. This is why the television show, everyone wants to be a millionaire is a lure. This is why the lottery is a lure, because everyone's trying to find provision without having to be under the weight of labor in exchange for provision. Everyone's tired of running, are they not? You want to retire so you can finally stop and do what you want to do. You want Friday night so you can finally stop and do what you want to do. You want vacation because you want to finally stop and do what you want to do, right? And so Drenna and I say, we've learned this, until you understand, until you fix the money thing, you'll never find out who you are. Because slaves are slaves. They don't envision much more than stopping. In fact, the poverty mindset, its goal is to stop. And instead of create, because you don't want to create more labor, right? People that have a slavery poverty mentality do not create because they're already overwhelmed. People that are overwhelmed do not create more. You've heard keeping your nose to the grindstone. People with their eyes looking down do not see opportunities. All right, so there's a whole lot we can cover there, but the bottom line of what we understand is that Adam gave the kingdom away. Painful toil and sweat is how you've, what you know how it works. You're either running after provision, or if you have some, you're learning, trying to hoard it. Because the only escape out of the earth curse system is to have more than enough. That's the only escape. I want you to write that down. The only escape out of the earth curse system of poverty and lack is having more than enough. Got it? That's vital. One more story. We're closing this session. These laws of the kingdom that provides freedom for you are all written right here in the Bible. And God will help you understand them. But anyone can learn how to, how to use the law. I mean, I like to use the light switch example. If the lights were not on in here, what would you do? Turn the switch on, right? But you had to learn to do that. And so it is in the kingdom. Anyone can learn how to turn the switch on. Anyone can learn how the kingdom operates. If you'll look at it in that way, that you have a legal right as a citizen, you learn the laws, you have the benefit, et cetera, et cetera. And so a very familiar story, I'll close for those that haven't heard it, but it's a good illustration of my daughter's dog you saw, Kirsten, our youngest, at 12 years of age, heard me teaching on the kingdom, saw all these things happen, saw us come out of debt. You know, we are pinching ourselves every day. Did you see that? Can you imagine that? It's amazing. We're just like bouncing off the walls half the time. It's like, Wow. Seeing these things happen. You got to remember, nine years of living in not just slavery, but actually dysfunctional mindset, just horrible. And seeing freedom, I mean, we were like, I still am. I mean, I just got to tell people. I mean, I got to tell people. So she sees all this. She sees I get my deer every time I go out. I brought my deer home Monday morning. Kids, yeah, daddy goes deer. And it's like, yeah, the kingdom works every time. 15 minutes. Now, I'm not saying it has to be 15 minutes. It could have been an hour. I don't care, but I'm coming home with it. Just happened to be 15 minutes. So she meets me one day after church. And I went to her bedroom, I guess. This, this, I went to her bedroom to say goodnight to her. And she had put a picture of a Pomeranian on the wall. Now, you parents know what's happening next. She wants a Pomeranian, right? But see, she lived in the same bedroom with her sister, Polly, who already had a dachshund in the room. I don't want another dog. So I said, I'm going to head this off. I'm head to the house. Kirsten, I love you, but we're not having another indoor dog. Sorry. Just love on, love on your sister's dachshund. Just give it a hug, you know? Well, that Christmas time, her mother, because she kept talking about Pomeranians, her mother gave her a stuffed one. That's bad. According to Hebrews chapter 11, what's bad about it? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. A picture. She's reinforcing that picture on the inside of her 
of this Pomeranian. So a couple months later, she greets me after church with a little smirk on her face and says, Dad, today, today I received a Pomeranian puppy by faith, just like you teach. I said, now, Kirsten, you know, I thought, okay, well, I'm not buying it. So I went down. I was invited to teach at a little church, maybe 30, um, well, it was down in Mississippi, and it was way out in the country. I even asked God, why don't you send me all this way down there, way out in the country? I mean, I'll go where you say. It's a little... Just a few people there. I know God loves people. I'm fine going anywhere. So I get there. I teach one session. The pastor walks up to me after the session and says, you know, I had something really strange happen. I don't know if you know this or not, but I raised Pomeranians. I have a six-week puppy that needs to find a home, and God said I'm supposed to give it to you. And what I said, I'm ashamed of today. I said, no, he didn't. I'm not doing that. <laughs> so I went and told Drenda about this. And she said, you mean you're going to, you know, not let your daughter's fat? I mean, you would, no, no, of course not, Drenda, of course not. Huh? No, we're taking the dog home. <laughs> and she was right. Took the dog home, cursed and met us at the airport. It was awesome. She was crying. TSA was crying. Everyone at baggage was crying. I, I guarantee you could have a ministry carrying a puppy through an airport. I guarantee it. <laughs> but the point is, here's the question of the day, and what I'll leave you with before the next session. How did the puppy show up. It's the only time in my life I was given a dog. It was specific. It was in the season. How did the dog show up? Okay, you would say, well, God did it. I know God did it. I'm not asking that. I want to know why God did it, how he did it. I cannot duplicate these lights, even though I enjoy them, unless I understand the laws governing lights. Without knowing how the lights operate, I cannot duplicate them. Right? So the question is, how did that dog show up? Why did that dog show up? Why that dog, that specific dog, what happened in the kingdom, in the spiritual realm that caused that to happen? We'll break on that one. I'll let you think about that. All right? We'll come back. But we're going to talk more about those laws. And unless you can teach it, you can't live it. Yeah, Jesus defended himself with the word. Unless you can teach it, unless you know how it works, you don't guess with electricity. Let's see. I think I can run these lights on 220, maybe 440. Let's just try it. You're going to have an explosion, right? No, there's very specific laws you have to learn. And if you can't teach it, don't plug them together because it's going to be bad, right? No, it's not going to be what you want. And so it is in the kingdom. Unless you can teach it, unless you can duplicate it, you're not going to have the result you want. So... That's what we're talking about. This is the kingdom of God. You're in the kingdom of God, and the kingdom has been given to you. Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom. In that kingdom, you'll find your answers. Amen.